we are discussing with Dr. Manoj Chadda two areas which are in his domain. One is thyroid diseases and the other is metabolic bone disease. Uh, so we'll start with thyroid disease, sir. Uh, you will, uh, might need to keep the mic because... Okay. Okay, uh, first of all, we'll discuss hypothyroidism. And, uh, sir, your uh, take on the presentations and what presentations do we miss as family physicians? We know the standard presentation, obviously, but what do we miss? So, I think uh, if you look at today disorders that we see in practice, Everyone keeps talking about diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer. But thyroid disease per se, it affects probably about 10% of population. So it's a huge number. So if tomorrow some student tells I want to become a thyroid specialist, I'll say please go ahead, there's plenty of work to do. And thyroid hormone, as you know, affects every organ system in the body. So, every doctor should know something about the thyroid. So, as I said, it affects every organ system. You can start from the head to the foot or you can start from common to rare. What I tell my students is you have to look at the change. Someone has always had a poor sleep and continues to have that. That is not thyroid. But if there is a change in behavior, change in appetite, change in weight, change in bowel habits, again, focus is change, then you have to think of thyroid. There may be other reasons. I mean, one of the commonest things that patients come to me is either weight gain or hair loss. And that, if you ask, even 100 of us, 70 will say yes to both. Or weight gain is also common and hair loss is also common. So keep that in your mind as a possible fact. In growing children, the growth chart is something which is very valuable. You must keep it for your grandchildren. Maybe your children must be all uh, pretty old, but grandchildren, you must keep that because it gives you more information than any blood test that you will do. Behavioral change, scholastic performance. These are all suggestive of some thyroid problem. Somewhere you know, GS people have this habit of giving rare things first, but no, I'm putting it right at the bottom. Delayed puberty and rarely precocious puberty can also be a part of hypothyroid. Um, as I said, it's rare, but it's not something you don't see in practice. Average pubertal stage, again, delayed puberty, menstrual irregularities, uh, could be a presentation over the standard, what I told you, weight gain and hair loss and feeling tired and fatigue and things like that. But remember, you won't get one exclusive. So a patient will say, I've been putting on weight. That putting on weight is more likely because of changing eating habits over your uh, thyroid part. But yeah, we would still investigate them. What, uh, sorry. One, one secret, because someone said pearls is what is most important. If you see a fat child, the one thing that you should do is take their height and then ask two questions. Ask one question to the parents and one to yourself. Is the child short in class, tall in class or tallest in class? Hypothyroids never become tall. Hmm? So exogenous obese child will always grow tall. And for yourself, I told you that growth chart, if you find that they are taller than average, I think, you know, if you are not keeping that growth chart in your clinic, please start keeping it. Because it gives you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And the standard stuff will go on, but uh, as you said, rare things or odd things which we miss out, paresthesia, uh, any odd behavior, memory lapses, which is again becoming very common for us. Uh, you overload your systems, you're going to have memory lapses. But as long as you remember afterwards or you understand that you're having a memory lapse, you don't need to worry. Hmm. The problem comes and, are mere ko to sab yaad hai. <laughs> then you are in trouble. Yeah. Uh, about, sir, we'll not take questions for the moment. We'll of course take questions at the end of the topic. Because you will realize that we'll cover everything. 
uh, investigations, basic investigations, and then also a question. Sometimes reports of some complete health checkup might guide you to investigate for thyroid. Anything on that? For example, dyslipidemia. Okay. So, I think uh, we are very fortunate today that you can prescribe a TSH or a TSH T4, T3 in any corner of the country and you'll get the report in a couple of hours or maximum 24 hours. But when we started training in 1983-84, anyone who wanted a thyroid test in KEM hospital needed our permission. The registrar had to sign the requisition to get a TSH T4 done in practice. So things have changed. So that's very reliable. 98 out of 100 times you don't have to worry. So some people talk of economy, only one test. I feel today labs give you everything in that one cost only. So don't cut on the test. TSH, T4, T3. And uh, I think what is common today is this T4, T3 is normal. TSH is normal, then you know this is not thyroid. But the TSH may be 5, 6, 7, if the normal range is say 4.5. And that is time where you need to scratch your head, do you need to treat them or not? I'll talk about this probably a little later. But as he mentioned, lipids, uh, hypercholesterolemia, an LDL which is borderline elevated, think of thyroid. A triglyceride which is elevated, but with the cholesterol elements are all in range, think about, correct, think about sugar. Oh, but I don't have diabetes. There is no diabetes in my family. His triglyceride is 300, 250. You are pre-diabetic, even if your sugars are. So, I mean, it's a warning. Um, again, thyroid can go with other chronic disorders. So, hypertension is something also that you should look for. And if you treat the thyroid, these things can become okay also. So, you don't have to rush into treating everything at the same time. Uh, about free T3, free T4, often a question is asked, what do we do? So, free T3, free T4, the way it is done in our country or our city or across the globe is a one-step method, which is good, but you can't swear by it because there may be problems. The research that you read on free T3, free T4 is what is called as a two-step method. First, because of dialysis, they remove the free hormone and then they test it. So it's a two-step method. That is very reliable. Chromatography is very reliable. Chemi, what we do in most labs, is good. I somehow still feel that in most cases, we should continue with T3, T4. Now they are equally cost-effective. They are good labs. Some people are used to it. Some labs have stopped doing T3, T4. I am quite okay with that, but really there are very few situations where you need FT3, FT4. Even most of the thyroid associations have said continue with the T3, T4, but I would not get too worked up about it. So whatever you all are continuing, please continue. Don't Because I said I like to do T3, T4 doesn't mean you have to get worked up about it. But uh, there are situations probably when we talk about thyroiditis, remind me again, I'll tell you why you should do only T3, T4. Okay. Uh, once we have diagnosed frank hypothyroidism, not subclinical, frank hypothyroidism, uh, how do you initiate treatment uh, in a non-pregnant person? We'll discuss pregnancy. Okay. So, you know, unlike um, diabetes or hypertension, or cholesterol or calcium, there are so many options available. In hypothyroidism, good old thyroxin is the only treatment as of today and your carry home is to continue with using thyroxin. It has to be started in a small dose in the 40 plus. Assume that they have underlying ischemic heart disease, go slow and worse the TSH the slower you need to go, elderly the patient, slower you need to go. Yeah, it's different if you have a 15, 20, 25 year old, you can start with the full dose. But otherwise, 
there is no hurry take with small say 25 or 50 micrograms and keep on building up the average requirement for a thyroid patient is 1.7 microgram per kg body weight so keep that in mind but again i repeat there is no hurry to normalize tsh you don't know how long that patient's tsh has been like that so it's like your car on a winter morning stationary for a last few days you don't straight put it in the third and fourth gear you put it on you wait for some time then you go to the first gear second gear so similarly take your time we say four to six weeks before the next increment and that is the time you need to do the test again no idea doing test every two weeks because tsh takes time to come down uh, this is very important 1.7 micrograms per kg body weight so what he said is that if you have a 25 year old female who comes with hypothyroidism and uh, she is 60 kg you may straight away start 100 micrograms for example based on the body weight and don't go titrating from low down but in an elderly because we can precipitate ischemic heart disease in an atherosclerotic patient we must go slow and build up the dose uh, you said about uh, uh, frequency of testing so can you give us a guideline as to after the first dosing how many weeks we should repeat so, the TSH and should we do T3, T4, TSH or TSH if the cost is different? Yeah, so I said TSH takes about four to six weeks to normalize. T4 and T3 will come up within a few days. But since it is the TSH which is a marker of health of the thyroid eventually, we follow it up every six weeks to eight weeks. And once they have stabilized, you can do it every four to six months. Okay provided the weight remains constant. See, people are nowadays in this weight loss business. So if someone loses 4 or 5 kilos, then you need to recheck again because 1.7 microgram is the average and they may need less doses. Having said about what is the maximum dose you have ever used in hypothyroidism due to Hashimoto's? So there are outliers. Uh, Senior endocrinologist will give you a figure. I am saying I have used up to 400 micrograms. So there is no upper limit. But anytime when you cross 1.7 micrograms, you need to first look for compliance. Thyroxine, it has to be taken on an empty stomach. Food interferes with the absorption. So if you are taking it after a meal, if the patient doesn't follow this empty stomach business and nothing to eat after that for half an hour, the absorption can vary from 35% to 85%. So it can be really variable. So you have, before you say, oh, this is not working, you ensure that the patient is taking the tablets, taking it on an empty stomach, waiting for half an hour, because they take it on an empty stomach and then they have that nimbu pani or tea chai. or chai or what fruit juice or whatever. So that gap is very, very much necessary. If I can add one little pearl again, what I do to ensure that my patients are taking it properly, ask them to take an empty bottle. Thyroxine always comes in a colored bottle or now in an opaque bottle because light can affect it. Take an empty bottle, Sunday morning, the dose, say, normally it would be seven tablets a week, whatever dose we have. That seven tablets on Sunday morning go into the bottle. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday morning when they get up, there should be ideally one tablet in the bottle. But there is not one, but two or three. They missed out during the week. The bottle goes into the, I mean, the contents go into the mouth. So whatever, two, three, four tablets. And it's pretty safe. I've had a handful of patients in these years who have told me, Doctor, you said that Sunday go bottle is empty on Sunday. So I do it every, every Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> so there is a company which came out with this once a week business. Didn't become popular for other reasons. Uh, don't encourage your patients, but see to it that they take the full dose. Good old days, we had only 100 micrograms available. So we have been trained to treat patients with 100 micrograms. Now the younger generation has got eight strengths. So they can very easily say, change the bottle. 
I still continue with that weekly dose, you know, like that KEM thing about don't waste money, patients are all poor, so that still continues. But don't waste, you can adjust the weekly dose. Uh, some people, when they titrate doses, they will say take 100 Monday to Friday, take 150 Saturday, Sunday, etc., etc. So there are, these are personal quirks yeah. or these are... No, like no, so these are personal quirks, right? What we need to remember is thyroxine has a half-life which is nearly seven days. So unlike blood pressure tablets or diabetes tablets, where you can't say they take half today and one tomorrow. But with thyroxine, you can jolly well do it. The weekly dose is what is important. So you can do it every day, absolutely correct. Or you can do it like what you said, 100 every day, 150 on one day, miss one day. This is all. But please try to keep it simple. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, take 150, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, take 125. Those, I mean, as long as you're on the same page with your patient, it's fair enough. I repeat, it is the weekly dose which is important. Another thing that has happened currently is that we have a diabetes medicine called semaglutide. Yeah. And there is a problem with those who are taking thyroxine and semaglutide. Can you elaborate? Okay, so yeah, so semaglutide has to be taken on an empty stomach with half a glass of water. Nothing to take after that for half an hour. It can follow after half an hour with the thyroxine tablet. Now, half an hour for semaglutide, half an hour for thyroxine, it may become a torture for those who need the cup of tea early in the morning. The way forward is, Number one, if you get up at night, tell the patient to take the thyroxine anytime, two hours after dinner. So there was uh, in between a couple of papers which talked about thyroxine at bedtime. The problem is, number one, most of us eat very late dinner. Number two, people eat early dinner but end up having a snack or a tea or a coffee at night. So it is two hours after the last meal, it's not dinner, I mean your dinner may be at 7 p.m. and then at 10.30 you have your cup of tea or coffee, then it doesn't work. So the, these are the three options, after semaglutide, at bedtime, if there is a two hour gap or in between if you get up. Which other medicines like pantoprazole, PPIs are often taken by patients before breakfast? Is there an interaction between thyroxine and PPIs and can they be taken together or no? No, no. So, with thyroxine you ensure that there is nothing around it. So, PPIs and, and, and your antacids and all that should be away. So, AKT patients on rifampicin before breakfast, PPIs before breakfast, everything has to be away from thyroxine. There are uh, some fancy uh, patients who get fancy family physicians who give fancy full thyroid supplements like thyroid extract. For example, I don't know what are they, but there is something like that. Uh, what should we tell the patient? Discourage them or? So thyroid extract came up in the 60s and the 70s when there was no thyroxine. It's an animal extract. Please avoid prescribing that. Thyroxine, when you give a standard brand, so we don't like to change brand. If a patient is on brand A, we let it be. Doesn't mean that the B is bad. Patient is on B, let them be on B. And if it's on C, let them be on C. Uh, if I could stick my neck out, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, generics and thyroid treatment don't go together. Generic thyroid medicines or generics? No, generic thyroid medicines. Okay. First of all, there isn't much cost difference. I don't want to get into the argument about generic versus innovative. But for thyroid, I'm sticking my neck out. Because the production of thyroxine is not something which anyone and everyone can do it. So please stick with the standard, whatever brand you are comfortable with. Uh, lastly, about uh, placebo supplements. In every system, we have placebo supplements. Now, there is Thyrovel. I'll take a brand name. Yeah. Thyrovel is commonly prescribed. Should you withdraw that Thyrovel or let the patient enjoy it? So it's, let's say, supplementation is uh, a part of our prescription nowadays. Along with that, there is some amount of marketing gimmick. 
so this one brand that you just took the name is promoted for thyroid because it contains tyrosine everything any protein your milk your your standard stuff contains tyrosine so there is no great advantage to it having said that it's not going to hurt your patients you got preparations containing selenium uh, because that is another hot thing the problem with supplement is we don't know which one really helps them so please go ahead and use it in you know intelligent doses and don't think that it is the answer to all your problems because one of the big things nowadays along with reversal of diabetes is reversal of thyroid and i can even claim i do get patients over the years so aapne uska thyroid ka goli band kar diya tha we'll discuss sub clinical hypothyroidism but more often than not these patients don't need treatment tushar has given a prescription i see it and i said nahi ab usne likha hai to why should i break my head continue it and continue that's how it goes on i see patients on treatment for 20 25 years wo bachpan se chal raha hai and then i stop the medication and things are good and then some other person comes third person comes so there are wrong prescriptions you can stop i don't claim to cure thyroid but there are people who do that you know so we don't go in that direction uh we discussed dosing of thyroid and di- diagnosis of thyroid in non pregnant now let us come to pregnant first of all tell us the criteria for diagnosing hypothyroidism in pregnancy okay so number 1 hypothyroidism in non pregnant state tsh more than 4.5 and then t3 t4 anti tpo wagera wagera in pregnancy we still take the cut off as 4.5 but over the years we have been sort of you know, doctor and it's there in our mind that we want a target of 2.5 so anything between 2.5 and 4.5 you have to think treat or not to treat i'll tell you what to do above 4.5 generally we would treat above 10 definitely we'll treat the between 2.5 to 4.5 if there is a bad obstetric history if there is a family history of thyroid if there is a goiter or if the anti tpo is positive i will treat the guidelines say you may treat so i am saying that i will treat because it's a finite period treatment after all pregnancy is maximum 9 months and a few days and i'm not hurting the fetus or the mother and it's not an expensive treatment so all said and done either i am not doing anything great or i may be doing something very great for the fetus but i'm not hurting the mother so 2.5 to 4.5 you may treat above 4.5 you must treat in pregnancy in pregnancy so in pregnancy 4.5 or more in non pregnancy 4.5 or more may come under subclinical which we will discuss subclinical hypothyroidism so uh, in pregnancy once you start treating say at 4.5 what is your target and do you go slow in pregnancy also titration wise or you start at 1.7 mics yeah. per kg so the target is to get below 2.5 we don't go slow we are in a great hurry so this is absolutely opposite to what i just said 10 minutes ago so we can start with 1.7 and review within 3 to 4 weeks now the tsh to begin with may be 7 8 9 10 11 12 12 or it may be 50 60 80 100 100 but we start with that same 1.7 but review within 3 to 4 weeks uh one of the major question that will come up or still comes up to you is uh should we terminate the pregnancy good old teaching was that no no this thyroid is very dangerous and you should terminate the pregnancy and even today uh, we have this argument with gynex obstetricians i think most endocrinologists now agree on the fact that there is no reason to terminate pregnancy because of hypothyroidism the only time i agree for termination is when i find that the patient or the 
पेरेंट्स दैट मीन्स ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स टू बी डॉक्टर साहब आप गारंटी देते हैं कि बच्चा नॉर्मल होगा सो देन इट इज बियॉन्ड द स्कोप ऑफ ए डॉक्टर वी आर नॉट हेयर टू गिव गारंटी वी आर हेयर टू गिव डिसेंट केयर स्टैंडर्ड ऑफ केयर आई यू नो सॉर्ट ऑफ गो ऑन द डिफेंसिव अदरवाइज आई एम रिपीटिंग देर इज नो इंडिकेशन फॉर टर्मिनेटिंग ए प्रेगनेंसी फॉर थाइरॉइड पेरेंट्स डोंट वॉन्ट इट गलती हो गया आई जस्ट हैड टू वीक्स अगो ए डॉक्टर हिंदुजा टोल्ड मी दिस वन पेशेंट प्रेगनेंट सो एज यूजल मैडम का पेशेंट आता है आई आई सेड ओके विल डू अ वीडियो कंसल्टेशन एंड वी आर नाउ इन टू ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी टू सो शी डिलीवर्ड इन जनवरी ट्वेंटी टू एंड आई सेड यू आर प्रेगनेंट अगेन सर हाँ हो गया अभी देर आई डोंट गो टू मच इन टू इट दैट इज फाइन विल ट्रीट यू बट जनरली यू नो यू ऑलवेज हैव टू थ्री फोर ईयर्स गैप सो बट देर इज एब्सोल्युटली नो इश्यूज ट्रीट दैम एंड नाउ आई थिंक मोर एंड मोर डॉक्टर्स आर गेटिंग इंटरेस्टेड इन ट्रीटिंग थायरॉइड इन प्रेगनेंसी एंड इफ यू ऑल हैव एक्सेस टू इट बिकॉज आई एम श्योर यू कैन डू अ बेटर जॉब दैन ऑब्सटेट्रेशन बिकॉज दे दे कैन Yeah. Uh, play havoc with the treatment dose. So again, uh, what he said, I'll just crystallize it for you. In a pregnant hypothyroid, definitely without doing any antibodies, start thyroxine at 4.5 TSH or more, even if the T3 T4 are normal, and target the TSH to below 2.5, and the dose will be 1.7 micrograms per kg body weight. starting dose you don't go slow low and go up slowly and every 3 weeks maybe 4 weeks you will up titrate the dose as per necessity uh in a known hypothyroid who is already on 100 micrograms and is planning pregnancy planning not yet conceived what do you say excellent question i think that's something the crux which is more often so when they are planning pregnancy you ensure that the tsh is below 2.5 prior to pregnancy patient goes away is going to come back in the next 2 3 4 months there are two things to do one if possible when they conceive get a tsh t4 or a free t4 done immediately if however for some reason they cannot get a test done or they cannot get back to you the standard advice is at the di- confirmation of pregnancy the dose has to go up by 30% that is a part of normal pregnancy requirements so how to do 30% uh, we are not mathematicians the simple answer is two tablets per week bada dene ka whatever the dose is two tablets per week they need to increase so twice a week they can step up the dose till they come to you and then you can uh, do the proper adjustments so this concept is very easy 7 days ka 30% is 2 days approximately ha uh, 130 yeah. so 2 days you have to 2 days ka dose if the patient is 75 per day you just give 75 plus into 2 150 extra per week if uh, the patient con- conceives and then comes to you uh, without doing the tsh you must yeah. increase and then do the tsh after 3 4 weeks No, no. So this is if it's if it's possible to do a TSH yeah. tomorrow morning, please do it. But if it's patient is outside or not near you and cannot come back to you immediately for follow, you can give the standard uh, standing instructions as it's called. Okay. Uh, I'm during preg- one yeah, last sorry. part is yeah. during pregnancy, unlike non-pregnant state, the dose may increase from 10 to 40 percent. so tell the patient in advance say don't worry you know because every time they come and you say ha thoda dose badhana padega then start getting worried pre warn so this is a normal part of pregnancy requirements uh, i'm going to take the car a bit in reverse the principal cause of hypothyroidism in mumbai for example would be hashimoto's thyroiditis or an autoimmune disease any other cause that we need to kind of worry about and tra- change treatment according to etiology yeah so you're right uh, hashimotos or autoimmune thyroiditis is the commonest cause 
we don't have iodine deficiency in Mumbai, Maharashtra, any coastal area. So that we can rest assured. Uh, one of the controversies that continue from 70s till today is should we be taking iodine, iodized salt? Uh, without going into it, the answer is yes. Uh, the other reasons for thyro hypothyroidism are actually all rare. Um, commonest is post-surgery, post-radioactive iodine, uh, sometimes a pituitary problem. In this COVID era, we have started seeing COVID-induced thyroid problems, which probably we'll take it up well, later. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, about salt, you said iodized salt. So one question that we must ask every patient in history taking is what kind of salt they are taking? Because it's very fashionable to take unusual salts, like Himalayan different salt, different colored salt, different pink salt, <laughs> <laughs> etc. So you must ask them, and iodized salt is probably very important. About diet in uh, in hypothyroid, many people say don't eat cauliflower, cabbage, wo. So what is the advice? Okay, that's one of the few things that r really irritate me. So as students, so I'm talking of the 70s, we were taught that if you give kilograms of cabbage to that little rabbit, they get a goiter. Because cabbage contains certain goitrogens. If you were to translate that into 70, 80, 90 kilo human, human beings, then you should not give them tons of cabbage. But the normal person takes 100, 200, 300 grams of cabbage, nothing happens. So cabbage, broccoli and cauliflower and all that, don't bother. The other thing I tell my patients is, if you are a diabetic, I'll say don't eat sweets, batata vada, fried stuff, because by eating that, you can harm yourself and by not eating that you can do good for yourself. In thyroid if I don't eat cabbage my thyroid is not going to become okay and if I eat cabbage my gland is anyway not working I'm taking thyroxine it is not going to hurt it also. So whatever is prevalent at home please do it. There is no specific dietary advice to be given to thyroid patients. We go to subclinical hypothyroidism. Just to introduce the topic, subclinical has nothing to do with clinical manifestations. Subclinical has to do with high TSH but normal T3, T4. And the high TSH probably would be defined as 4.5 to 10. That is the definition of subclinical hypothyroidism. Is that the correct definition or more than 10 we chalta hai? Yes, more be 10 chalta wo bolenge, but uh, let's stick to 4.5 to 10 first. Okay, so that is how, now when a patient comes to you who has say weight gain as a symptom and has a TSH of 8 or 9 and this patient has been told that you have to start medicine and comes to you for advice. In which situations, and uh, I would request you to give us a list, in which situations would you start thyroxine and in which would you not start thyroxine and just repeat the TSH after a duration? Okay, so let's start with the most common reference in clinic. Weight gain, TSH is 5.5, 7, 8, whatever it is. And the patient is relieved because the doctor told them, tomorrow ko thyroid hai, is weight bad hai. So now my responsibility is over. It is between the endocrinologist and the thyroid gland. I am not going to do anything about it. Weight gain by itself through a leptin mechanism raises the TSH. So the TSH is not responsible for weight gain. The weight gain is responsible for the TSH. So you need to take care of that, number one. The second commonest reference is the perimenopausal lady. Again, yeah, she has weight gain, water retention. You know, standard what we've been taught, hypothyroidism, water retention, puffiness of face, rings have become tight. These patients also don't do well with thyroxine replacement. I have seen thyroxine 50, 100, 150, 200 micrograms also. They become toxic, but that water retention and the morning puffiness of the face will not go. That is a progesterone effect. That is a salt retention effect. It has nothing to do with thyroxine. So clear cut that pure weight gain and perimenopausal ladies will not do well with 
thyroid replacement. The other place, before I say when to replace, is the elderly patients. You know, the 80 and the 90. So it's not unusual to see 75, 80 years old coming to you. That mild TSH elevation, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, with a normal T3, T4 does not need treatment. As a matter of fact, there are some Jew-based studies, not Indian, but Jews, that if your TSH is high and you are about 90 plus, you are likely to live longer than someone whose TSH is normal. So that probably is a uh, protective mechanism, let's put it like that. But all said and done, if you get a 75-year-old patient with a TSH of 6 or 8 or 12, don't rush into treatment. Because question that you need to ask, is what am I trying to treat? Don't treat that report, treat the patient. Sometimes, you know, the patient has been brainwashed that they have thyroid. 45-year-old uh, lady, perimenopausal, 7 kilos weight gain, TSH is 6. No, doctor, I have told you that thyroid is Then we do what is called as a therapeutic trial. As the name indicates, it's a trial with a therapy. But then your therapy should be single. You are giving vitamin D, calcium, B12, this thing, that thing, and thyroxine, and then saying patient is better. No. You try everything, and patient is not feeling better. Then you give thyroxine in that dose, 1.7 microgram per kg body weight, for a finite period. Please understand if there is a deficiency of calcium. You don't wait for two years to see whether the patient is improving or vitamin D or B12 or iron, for example. So similarly, thyroxine deficiency is there and you are convinced, patient is convinced, give a therapeutic trial, but for a finite period. Okay, I will wait for three months. If at the end of three months, patient has not improved, forget the reports, patient has to improve, then please accept that your diagnosis is wrong and we look for some other cause. So these are indications not to start thyroxine. You want to start thyroxine, number one, strong family history. Number two... I'll, I'll just remind them so that their focus is there. We are talking about TSH between 4.5 and 10, 10. And when to start thyroxine in these patients. Yeah. Correct. So when to start. Strong family history, if you have two or three reports, 2.5, 4.1, 6.3, a rising TSH is an indication to start treatment. Okay, presence of a goiter. Patient is a young lady is planning for pregnancy. The lady is already pregnant. No discussion. She has to start treatment. Adolescent children is a place where we could sit and argue, but some people would say, give them treatment, we'll review after they have finished their puberty. The presence of anti-TPO. Now, anti-TPO has become very common. You don't need to do it in every patient. I mean, someone has a TSH of 25, spending 1,000, 1,200 rupees for anti-TPO, for what? No. But if the TSH is 4.5, say, or 5.5, there's no family history, there's no goiter, you are in a hurry to take a decision. So first of all, there is no hurry. You can call the patient back after three months. But if you are in a hurry, do an anti-TPO. So a high anti-TPO, there is a 30 to 50 percent chance that this patient will progress into subclinical hypothesis. Why we are worried about treatment is one third of subclinical hypothyroids revert back to normal. So you, you are unnecessarily putting a label. One third will remain as they are. 6.5 to 6.5. One third will progress into proper disease, and to identify that one third, we do this whole exercise. Uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, the dosing, of course, remains the same. Even if the TSH is 5.5, you will still give 1.7 micrograms. Is that right? Absolutely. If you have to dose, the average dose remains 1. Point, yeah, you may not start with 1.7. You may start with one, but you keep in mind that once you take a decision to treat, see I see sometimes prescriptions of 12.5, 25, now that is not allopathy, let's not go that way. Because what you will do in that process is, 
You see, after all, the thyroid is working and it is producing thyroxine. By giving thyroxine from outside, you are suppressing the body's thyroxine and not making much difference to the TSH. Uh, he was talking about uh, TSH in the elderly. So, is there, I mean, are there recommendations saying that the normal values of TSH should now be extended to 7 in the elderly or no, no such thing? No, no, no. No. The normal is still the normal. Still the normal, okay. What if, if you do see newborns, that is interesting because we try to encourage newborn screening between day 2 and day 5. So, those who get to see newborns, screen for TSH, T4, T3 should not be looked at because in newborns the conversion of T4 to T3 is defective. So, you will always get very low values. And the normal TSH in a newborn is? No, it's up to, it's up to 30, not 4, not 5, not 10, up to 30. So, s some neonatologists, newborn specialists will say, let's repeat it after week 10 days. No, no alarm, no pains. But if it is 5, 6, 8, 10, you just forget it, it is normal. We now go to hyperthyroidism. Uh, the commonest hyperthyroidism that we see, barring the viral thyroiditis, is Graves disease, which is another autoimmune disease. And uh, uh, first of all, can we clarify whether when you said family history of thyroid disease in a subclinical hypothyroid, does Graves count as family history? It is family history of thyroid disease. It is not family history of hypothyroidism. So, in families, it runs anything. It just may be a nodule, it may be Graves, it may be uh, hypothyroidism. So, it is thyroid disease broadly speaking, not a specific diagnosis. Correct. So, Graves disease, uh, tell us about, first of all, thyroid, the difference between the terms. What is hyperthyroidism? What is thyrotoxicosis? Yeah. So, if some of you have heard my, me talking about hyperthyroidism, we'll know the answer. But that's one of the pearls that you should carry from here today. Why do we need two terms? When for hypothyroidism, we say only hypothyroidism. We never have a second term of it. So, thyrotoxicosis is the term that we use to describe the clinical situation that the patient comes to. Weight loss, palpitations, tremors, sweating, feeling very hungry, not sleeping well. You know, the standard toxic symptoms. You do the blood test, uh, T3, T4 are elevated, TSH, you know. We didn't discuss the control of the thyroid, but I'm sure you know that uh, one goes up, the other goes down. So, this is the thyrotoxicosis syndrome. Now, why do we need hyperthyroidism? Hyperthyroidism is a state where the gland is hyperfunctioning, hyperthyroid. The gland is hyperfunctioning. So, then someone will say, but Obviously, the gland is hyperfunctioning, then only they'll get thyrotoxicosis, no? So, can someone tell me the commonest reason for thyrotoxicosis without hyperthyroidism? Correct. So, iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis, overdosage, is the commonest cause. Will you treat them with antithyroid drugs? No. So, that is why you need to separate hyperthyroidism thyrotoxicosis and non-hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis because hyperthyroidism needs antithyroid treatment non-hyperthyroidism needs what I call time pass I tell my patients very truthfully ki, time pass karenge aap thik ho uh, how we most of us know the clinical syndrome of thyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroidism we will not go there uh, how do you diagnose biochemically uh, hyperthyroidism? So, still again the same good old TSH comes to our help. So, we know the homeostatic mechanism. TSH is produced from the pituitary gland. It works on the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland produces T4, T3. T4 goes up and tells the pituitary gland that enough is there. Take it easy. So, 
in a situation where the gland hyperfunctions, more and more T4 is produced, so it suppresses the TSH. So when you get a health checkup report and the TSH is suppressed and there is no T3, T4 with it, then you think about thyrotoxicosis. And if you have the T3, T4, then you can follow it up with whatever more you want to do. Uh, every patient who has hyperthyroid symptoms and T3, T4 elevated, TSH suppressed, every such patient uh, Will, uh, you won't need an anti-TPO to prove Graves as a cause. So Do again, you need that? You know, you look at a toxic patient, uh, eye signs, goiter, plus minus family history, you're probably dealing with Graves. Okay. Now, if you are a doctor who wants all the investigations done for your patient because you have to fill out a pro forma, please do it. But otherwise, you don't need an anti-TPO for diagnosis. The anti-TPO may be useful in deciding the choice of therapy, which probably will come to. Okay. Uh, so, any other specific investigations that you want to do in th hyperthyroidism? So, I'll tell you what not to do. Again, like I said, because I have a performer to fill out and I have a hospital that I want to please, I'll say anti-TPO not necessary. I'll say ultrasound, thyroid. If there is no goiter, what are you doing ultrasound for? And the worst investigation is a thyroid scan. One is thyroid scan is not available in your clinic next door. The patient has to go to a big hospital. And what are you... See, Dr. Bhandarkar used to say three things. When you write a prescription for the investigation, what are you looking for? Okay. How is it going to help the patient? Who's going to pay for it? Hmm. I mean, I have a research lab and I need to do A to Z. Okay, do it. But you pay for it. Or get your research unit to pay for it. And don't harm the patient. I mean, just because I'm in a big center and I want to do a biopsy in everyone or put a needle in everyone, don't harm the patient. So keep that in mind and then do what you want to do. So. Sonography, thyroid scan, very restricted use. And uh, we used to have this argument with our nuclear medicine people. Whenever we had a common meeting and one of our endocrinology, I still remember somebody from the US in 2001, uh, Mumbai was doing the endocrine conference and uh, Dr. <coughs> Ved Gosai was speaking from the US and then our nuclear medicine person, Dr. Krishna was supposed to speak. And uh, Dr. Gosai already said, absolutely useless investigation. <laughs> so it becomes very difficult. So, yeah, unless you have a nodule or you are worried about thyroiditis or something. But routinely, graves, please don't ask for scan. So, uh, <clears throat> how do we then... Uh, so, uh, hyperthyroidism has several causes. One is graves, one is toxic nodule, solitary toxic nodule or multinodular toxic goiter. So, <clears throat> when do you suspect toxic nodules or multinodular goiter causing hyperthyroid? So, you've got thyrotoxicosis. You feel the neck of the patient. There is one bump, one lump. That's a toxic nodule. And if it's more than one, or if the nodule is palpable and the rest of the gland is palpable, as Dr. Samsi used to teach us, that becomes one plus, more than one. So, it is multinodular goiter. <laughs> and our fingers are not as good as the new sonography machine because if you do a sonography for anybody, anybody, uh, large number of us will have thyroid nodules. You don't need to worry about this. So I would say what your fingers can feel are significant. What the sonography machine picks up is really not significant. You can so Graves, toxic nodule, toxic multinodular goiter. You have probably covered up. 95, 98% of hyperthyroidism. What you have left out is a rare pituitary tumor, TSH producing, which can cause hyperthyroidism. So, uh, important that in a hyperthyroid patient with high T3, T4, important to check the thyroid gland, the neck, palpate the neck, more important than in hypothyroidism, because as you know, the management is different, and we'll discuss that for uh, all three of them. Uh, now, 
treatment management. I'll just give them one brief. There are three ways to treat Graves' disease. One is anti-thyroid drugs, one is radioactive iodine, and one is surgery. Three principal ways. And uh, so, what is your first choice in a standard Graves' disease? So, standard Graves' disease, we all agree now that medical treatment is the first choice. The other things can follow up in the sense if it's a large goiter, it's not going down, patient has to get married, patient cannot follow up with you, then we look at ablation, that means either surgery or radioactive iodine. But for most people now, medical treatment is the preferred line of treatment. It's very simple, again, uh, there are two classes of drugs, but we use only one because the second class can cause severe labor damage. So, profile thyrosyl is not used except in the first trimester of pregnancy. So, we forget that. Carbimazole or now methimazole. Methimazole is used in the US, carbimazole is used in India. Carbimazole gets converted to methimazole in the body. So, that's the thing. In hypothyroidism, I said go slow, build it up slowly. Here, I'm saying the opposite in hypothyroidism. Give the full dose and come down slowly. The investigating part is still remains the same. We don't follow it every 10 days or 15 days. But start with, so the standard dose is 30 milligrams of carbimazole or 20 milligrams of methimazole. Uh, we could give it, I mean, we normally give it in three divided doses till the patient stabilizes. But there are people who would say, no, 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 give it as a single dose because although the half-life in the blood is less, but within the thyroid, it takes care of 24 hours. So you can give it as a single dose also. What you need to remember is all the complaints that we talk about will not get corrected with the antithyroid drug because antithyroid drugs will act right away, but the circulating thyroxine will take five half-lives to clear out. So beta blockers mainstay of the, keeping the patient asymptomatic and the old standard beta blockers, not the selective beta blockers. So probably one of the places where propranolol is still used uh, between 20 and 40 milligrams in most patients and they really work wonders, you know, the tremors, the sweating, the apprehension, palpitations all go down with propranolol, not with the antithyroid drugs. So, we, I'll just repeat that, if you have a hyperthyroid patient, symptomatic, you will always give, for the first few weeks at least, a beta blocker like uh, propranolol, up to 40 milligrams per day usually, and an antithyroid drug started at 30 milligram of uh, uh, carbimazole or 20 milligram of methimazole, and then go down when needed as per the next test. So, what should be the follow-up tests? TSH or D34? No. So, this is the condition we said in the beginning TSH is suppressed. T3, T4 are high. You start treatment within six weeks, the T3, T4 will start coming down to normal. The antithyroid drugs work immediately, within hours, but five half-lives to clear the circulating T4. The TSH may take weeks or even months to come up. So, this situation you cannot rely on TSH to know what is the right treatment. You need T4 and T3. TSH, if it goes up, very good. See, there are situations like now average treatment is 12 to 18 months or say 15 to 18 months. We are reducing the dose. But after 8, 9, 10 months, uh, T3, T4 are normal. But TSH is 0.05 or there is a fairly large goiter. Then you know that this patient is not going to go into remission. Then you start thinking of the ablation or really long term. So now we, uh, I said 18 months, but we give treatment for 5 years. We have given treatment for 10 years also. With antithyroid drugs? Yeah, because most of the side effects of antithyroid drugs, fortunately, occur in the first two months of treatment and are not serious except except a granulocytosis which is idiosyncratic it is not dose related it doesn't give you a warning you know one of the things we keep doing is 
checking the CBC again and again. The CBC you can check for your satisfaction and to see the hemoglobin. But tonight the count is, white count is 8,600. Nothing stops it from tomorrow morning becoming 860. That is why at least tell them that this is a possibility. Very rare, but something like this happens that you get a sore throat, you spit out blood, you get fever. Please come back immediately. So, uh, just uh, repeating this very important thing, when you prescribe carbimazole, one thing that while prescribing you should tell the patient is that if you develop fever or any infection like sore throat, please stop the carbimazole and maybe do a CBC and come to me or come to me immediately, whichever is convenient. Uh, about dosing adjustment, you said we start high, 30 milligrams or so, and then go down. At what levels of T3T4 do you start going down? So, you know, if the T4 was 15, 16, 18, T3 was 250, 350, whatever, and now it has started coming down. Once it touches the upper limit of normal, you can start reducing the dose, whether you reduce 5 milligram at a time or 10 milligram at a time, it's, it's okay. You know, we, we didn't say uh, in thyroxine, if we are over treating and you want to reduce the dose, don't make it half. You know, sometimes what happens is the patient is on 125 or 150 or 100 and the doctor just makes it 50 because the T3, T4 have gone high. Don't, don't do that. Go down by say 10%, 20%. And the other common mistake that we, we didn't, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't mention was that when you do the blood test, if it is going to be done in the empty stomach, early morning or after breakfast, don't give the tablet on that day. Give it after the test. Because invariably what happens is the tablet is T4. And if you're doing a free T4, you will get a report which is sky high. Mm -hmm. TSH is normal. T3 is normal. And then there is confusion. So, on the day of the test, no tablet. However, if the test is going to be done post-lunch, late in the evening, then the tablet can be given. So, four to six hours, you may have disturbance in the T4 levels. So, uh, as you said, many labs will tell you, okay, okay, TSH karana empty stomach pe karayenge. Please don't agree to that. TSH can be done anytime, any time of the day. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we were talking of reducing carbamazole. Uh, every two months you can do the test and gradually there is no great hurry. See, unless sometimes what happens is patient is frankly toxic, you started treatment, two months down the line, TSH has become 25, T4 has become 3, 4, T3 has become 100, 120 or 75. Then you need to take a decision, cut down by half or did I take a wrong, make a wrong diagnosis and then review your diagnosis. If the diagnosis was correct, it was Graves' disease, when will you stop suddenly, abruptly? No, I'll never stop it You'll abruptly. Stop. I will always taper it off. Okay. So, like I said, I'll do 30, 20, 10, 5. Um, but sometimes I would do 30, 10, 5. And very rarely, let me tell you what we were taught. I don't know, how many of you have heard block replace regime? Yeah, so those who have less hair have heard about it. <laughs> you are younger <laughs> then. But block replace, as the name indicates. So this came from Japan. They said that these antithyroid drugs have got immunosuppressant action. Uh, Hashimoto's graves are immune diseases, autoimmune disease. So continue the carbimazole for at least 12 months in the full dose. But obviously the patient will become hypothyroid after 3, 4, 5 months of treatment. So they say then you give thyroxine from the side. So you block full and give thyroxine. We don't do that because nowhere else in the world was this confirmed. So we don't follow that. But there are occasions where patient says, no, I will not take radioactive iodine, I will not get operated. But you can't keep the patient on carbimazole, but the minute you bring it down, the patient becomes toxic again. So you need to adjust between say 5 and 10 milligrams of carbimazole, small dose of thyroxine, or you have patients who are not going to follow up regularly with you. We do that also sometimes. And in children, sometimes we do that. So these are, I mean, just at the back of my, like you said, GS people have this thing of giving some rare things always. 
but it's probably in my practice, um, say out of 100 or 200, I would do it in one patient. Just to tell you it's rare, but it is a possibility. So because you see someone has given neomarcus also and thyroxin also, doesn't mean he's a fool. He's doing block, replace. Correct. Okay, uh, so you said you will gradually taper off the therapy. Uh, as, uh, as we know that any autoimmune disease can go into a remission. So Graves' disease can go into a remission when you will need to stop the carbimazole. And af after stopping, sometimes the Graves' disease comes back, sometimes it doesn't. So what is the recurrence rate? Okay, so you started treatment, you started tapering, patient is doing well, very happy, weight gain, everything is back. So there are certain things which indicate to you that this patient is likely to be good forever, which is about 40-50%, not 80-90%, it's about 40-50% remission. No goiter, a goiter which goes down on treatment, a patient who responds quickly. So if the TSH is 0 0.05 at the end of 12 months, highly unlikely that this patient will go in remission. A anti TPO, so that's where I said anti TPO becomes useful. Is anti TPO is strongly positive? This patient, in its natural, so the natural history of Graves is that about 30% of them will become hypothyroid with time. Mm. So, if the anti TPO is positive, so remember, anti TPO is a marker antibody. Body. It doesn't hurt the thyroid, it doesn't stimulate the thyroid. Those are all different immunoglobulins which we can't do it in our labs stimulating immunoglobulins, growth promoting immunoglobulins, uh, blocking immunoglobulins, those we don't have in our lab, so we have only anti-TPO. Earlier we used to call it AMA, now it is anti-TPO. So that can give you an idea that this patient is likely to go into remission. The opposite side, a nodule is there, multinodular goiter, large goiter, these are unlikely to ever go into remission. So, uh, repeating, because this is very important, if you do treat hyper most family physicians will refer hyperthyroid patients and treat hypothyroid patients. That is, the, I think, the general rule that they will not treat themselves hyperthyroid. But if you have a hyperthyroid patient and comes to you for follow-up, uh, if the medicine is off, remember that they can come back with the same hyperthyroidism, occasionally with hypothyroidism. So how frequently should you monitor a patient who's gone into a remission and now you have to just follow up or they have to follow up? Yeah, so that's good news. Patient has gone into remission. So what I would do is three months, three months, six months, one year. Two years if the patient stays in remission, then most likely he will be, I mean, forever. But the first two years are critical. And, you know, one of the commonest things they discuss is, sir, aajkal both stress hai, both tension hai, iske liye ho gaya. So, uh, not in hypothyroidism, but stress can precipitate a relapse in hyperthyroidism. So that's something we should keep in mind. If a patient, how, how early have you seen Graves go into remission? As early as what, three months? Oh yes, as early as three months, but again, I think treatment should continue at least for nine months. So even even if the dose has to be yeah, minimized. You bring minimize it to minimize, dose. say, 5 milligrams a day in the next 3-4 months and then keep it going on. Uh, again, there is no absolute reason for that. Hmm. But it's just that a teaching that at least for 9 months. Correct. Uh, in your experience, you said the earlier the remission occurs, the lesser is the chance of a relapse. So in your experience, if a uh, remission occurs, say in three or maybe six months, when will the relapse occur, if it occurs? So relapse can happen in the next two, three months. Or like I said, the longer they have been good, the lesser the chances yeah, so of it. So maybe two years. So even if I say two years, uh, it's never 100%. Mm -hmm. You must tell your patient that, Sal make the far to test karai later. Right. Probably that is a safe advice you can give. Uh, now we come to a patient who has not responded or has had side effects with uh, carbimazole. What is the second option? Uh, so, for a person who is trained at KEM hospital or Maharashtra, 
the second dose at treatment is radioactive iodine. The reason I said KEM or Maharashtra is because in other parts of the country, especially the north, people feel, the professors used to feel that radioactive iodine is very bad. Hmm? So, PGI Chandigarh, BHU, Banaras, they would not like to give radio. They encourage surgery. But for me, what I have been trained, radioactive iodine is safe. One shot method, get over with it. Dr. Bandarkar used to say, patient comes to you hyperthyroid, your duty is to get him down from hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, whether it is euthyroid or hypothyroid, doesn't matter. Hypothyroid is so much easier to treat, it's a safer disease. Hyperthyroid can be dangerous, especially as you grow older. You know, 30, 40, it may not make a difference, but when you have 50, 60, underlying ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, sudden death, all are known with hyperthyroidism. So we are very clear, radioactive iodine is a one-shot method. Uh, it's done at one of the large centers. It can't be done in your clinic or in my clinic. Two methods, one is to give a standard dose to everyone. The other is they do a scan, calculate the dose, and then give it. At the end of the two years or so, the outcomes are nearly the same, so it doesn't matter. Radioactive iodine all over the country comes from BRC, Mumbai. It leaves BRC Saturday morning. Now, depending upon how far your center is from that Turbe center, it will reach you in two hours. It may reach you in 24 hours, it may take you 36 hours. And it has to be given to your patients immediately. So most hospitals will call the patient Saturday evening, Sunday, max Monday. So you'll find private centers, they work on Sunday and they have a Monday off for this reason. Because radioactive iodine or any other radioactive tracer in India comes only from BRC. Uh, there are some people who import it, but for us, practical purposes, it is BRC. So how does it reach Delhi, for example? Yeah, so you have the lead cases uh, by air, it's, uh, it reaches Delhi cargo. From there, it will be sent to all the other centers. So anywhere in India, it will be between Saturday morning to Sunday evening, wow. it will reach there. So it decays, you know, the iodine-131 has a half-life of about seven days. So it has to be given within the first week and preferably in the first three days because the activity will go down otherwise. The students might not know the radioactive iodine, how is it given orally, is it a tablet, liquid? Okay. Or so radioactive iodine is actually liquid. Earlier on we used to say, or I mean I used to talk to my patients saying that two drops in a Coca-Cola or a juice. Nowadays what we do at the hospital is they put it in a capsule, just two drops or a drop and the patient swallows the capsule, goes home, two or three things to be told to the patient in advance. No public transport, no public places, no office, no kitchen. You can be at home, you can be with your family, but don't hug small children. Now, I mean, why all these things? Because the word radioactive is associated with it. Now, let me tell you, off the record. This is all nonsense. The International Atomic Energy Commission came up with these rules 40, 50 years ago. The radioactive iodine that we are giving, I-131, gives out two radiations, beta and gamma. Gamma is actually not harmful and is the one which comes out and we use our camera to catch the radiation. The radiation which is harmful is beta. Beta is the one which destroys the gland, which we use for hyperthyroidism. For diagnostics, it is the gamma ray. It's a gamma camera which picks up. And if you were to take a paper and keep it in front of the neck, the beta radiations can't even cross this paper. So really, why we need all these precautions, we don't know. But for five days, you have to follow it. That is the rule of the International Atomic Energy Commission. No physical contact, stay away from children, no going to the kitchen, no public place, no public transport. This is compulsory. Anything related to urination, not defecation? Ah, okay. So you go instead of flushing once, flush three times, but really it doesn't make much difference. Fair enough. Sorry? 
Oh yeah, I mean, yes, uh, you, would not, you would use it, uh, we avoid in children and we avoid it in uh, pregnant uh, ladies for obvious reasons. But what we were doing 30, 40 years ago, today has changed in the sense, if I get a 12 year old girl, I will give radioactivity. No. The only thing you need to do is avoid pregnancy for 6 months. So childbearing age is not a contraindication, but pregnancy is a contraindication and desire to become pregnant is the contraindication. Okay, uh, so that is radioactive iodine. After giving the first dose of radioactive iodine, how many patients require a second dose? Yeah, so once you've given the dose of radioactive iodine, more often than not, what we did was patient uh, was on medical treatment, we stop it for four days, give radioactive iodine and one week later start the medical treatment. We never stop beta blockers. But if radioactive iodine is the primary form of treatment, then after one week, we generally start the medical treatment for between three to four to six months. Obviously, again, keep tapering as the patient improves. But before six months, we don't take a call whether the patient has responded to treatment or not. Because if they need a second dose, which is in less than 5% patients, it will be after 6 months. And less than 1% need a th third dose. But generally 95% people do well with one dose. Obviously you want to select your patients. If it's a large goiter, multinodular goiter, radioactive iodine doesn't work. And then these are the people who should go for surgery. We'll come to that. Uh, again, as he said, very important to remember, if a hyperthyroid patient is going for radioactive iodine, you will stop the methimazole possibly, but you will not stop the beta blocker if it is going to, it is, if he is, uh, needs that by, for his symptoms. And after the radioactive iodine, you will always restart uh, carbimazole or methimazole and continue it for a few months. So, English, you see, sometimes, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, done MCQs in your lifetime. But uh, in medicine, always, never, you know, these are very dicey <laughs> things. You see, often, commonly, Maybe. rarely, you know, these are words. Uh, so when you see that in MCQ, I remember I have given MRCP uh, also outside. I have given entrance exams in India. And somehow I had this knack, and I think now most of us have developed this, that it's not the scientific part, but the English part which answers your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, now let's go to the third option, which is the surgery. When is surgery a must in a hyperthyroid patient? Okay, so one disclaimer is surgeons hate me mm. because I generally don't send patients for surgery. Mm. Yeah, so if they have to go for surgery, failure of medical or radioactive iodine, large multinodular goiter, large goiter, patient not ready for radioactive iodine, patient keen for a pregnancy within few months. I mean, these are the five, six things which come to my mind. Uh, some people would say children better do get operated, but I said now we are giving radioactive iodine to them also. So a large part of it depends where you have been trained. Hmm? Europeans don't like radioactive iodine, Americans like radioactive iodine. Indians, we are divided between the two. Yeah, so, for me, restricted cases for surgery, and I do have a certain reputation now in the city that this guy is not useless, is useless when it comes to surgery. So, yeah, the surgery is subtotal thyroidectomy, that is the surgery done, they leave behind some thyroid and take, take away most of it. I will not go into more details regarding the surgery or post-operative management. So the only thing, yeah, yeah. I think we don't, we are not surgeons, so we don't, and the, we are not appearing for exams, so standard complications. But after surgery, you must check for calcium because they get hypocalcemic tetany in these patients. They have not touched the parathyroid gland, but because of that thing, there is something called parathyroid stunning. So for a day or two, you may get this tetany and tingling around. So be careful about the calcium. Uh, sorry? Uh, no, I respect my surgeons. I don't even talk about that today. No. <laughs> that that has been given up, passed away. I mean, come on, our, let's say that our surgeons are very good. Yeah. So they don't have this thing. Otherwise, it's a pretty safe thing. 
36 to 48 hours, these patients are ready to go home. It's only that you have to follow up because these patients are going to become hypothyroid. The surgeon has done most of the removal of the gland, so you expect them to come back to you in between two and maybe four weeks. Like I said, thyroxine half-life is seven days. So in five half-lives, everything will get cleared. So between three and four weeks, you call them back, you'll see the TSH has started going up. Having said that, suppose the patient stays in Timbuktu, you don't call them back just to see the TSH. You know it's going to go up. Start thyroxine after one week. Don't start 100, start 50. And then follow up. So, uh, again, after radioactive iodine, gradual burning or the destruction of thyroid gland occurs. And as you said, by six months, the patient often becomes hypothyroid. So, take care of that. Every patient who undergoes radioactive iodine therapy, almost every patient will become hypothyroid at some time in life. It may be six months, it may be two years, but will become hypothyroid. Okay, we'll go to the next topic and um, there are two more topics that I would like to discuss. One is subclinical hyperthyroidism and one is uh, thyroiditis or viral thyroiditis. So, let's first discuss subclinical hyper. We, saw th we talked about subclinical hypo. Now, subclinical hyperthyroidism would be defined as? So, subclinical hyperthyroidism is much rarer than hypothyroidism, defined as a low TSH with normal T3, T4. So, we say that these patients are asymptomatic, but not really. If you were to check up, you will find some little tachycardia, they may be losing weight, uh, they may be a little behavioral change, some irritability. So, let's, but by definition it says that the TSH is low and the T3, T4 are normal. Low TSH here means less than 0.3? 0. Yeah, 0. 0.2. 0. 0.2, okay. Uh, are there any indications of treating subclinical? Yeah, I think, again, uh, very clear-cut indications. Postmenopausal ladies, uh, you have to treat because they otherwise have more incidence of bone disease, osteoporosis and heart disease. Uh, with men, it is, again, I would look at it clinically. If there's anything to suggest weight loss or patients are not doing well, two, three months uh, two, three times of follow-up, that means uh, six to twelve months of follow-up and patient is not doing well, then I would give them medical treatment. Uh, any anti-TPO antibody in subclinical? Same. If I see anti-TPO, I am relaxed that, okay, this patient is likely to go into a hypothyroid state, so there is no hurry to start treatment. Uh, the last topic, which is probably very interesting, uh, especially post-COVID, is viral thyroiditis. Thyroid gland can be affected by viruses just as many other organs of the body and viral thyroiditis is a uh, condition that is sometimes missed by us uh, generalists. So, uh, when should we suspect what are the clinical syndrome, uh, clinical symptoms that we make us suspect? Okay, that's I think an uh, important thing because if you talk to your patients, uh, weight loss, tachycardia, sweating, and we make a diagnosis of Graves. But really, if you dwell into the history, hyperthyroid patients have a slow, progressive months of history. No one will come and tell you that since the last two weeks I've been losing weight. They'll always say it's a progressive, slow disorder. So anyone who comes with a short history, your antenna should go up, especially in the current era. Earlier on, we used to see in a year three, four uh, subacute thyroiditis, but now we are seeing every month one or two cases. So the antenna should go up when there is a short history, and you need to ask two questions or three questions. History of fever in the last few weeks, fever. History of pain in the neck, and either you or someone has given them that substandard antibiotics for throat infection. And what is very typical is pain radiating to the ear, very typical, that you know that this <coughs> is thyroiditis. Two things in the beginning of our program I said, one that I like to do T3, T4 and not free T3, T3, this is where it becomes very useful because 
in a normal person, 80 percent T4 is secreted from the gland, 20 percent T3, and T4 gets converted to T3 in the periphery. When the gland is hyperfunctioning, then the percentage of T3 production goes up. But when the gland is damaged because of thyroiditis, the stored hormone comes into the circulation. So the T4 is high and the T3 is just high. What has been there for 50 years is we look at the T3 T4 ratio. T3 normal is, I remember it as 100 to 200 nanogram per deciliter. Some people say nanogram per ml, then it will be 1 to 2. But let's keep it 100 to 200, it's easy to understand. And T4 is 4 to 12 microgram per deciliter. So you separate the units out, T3 upon T4. In hyperthyroidism will be more than 20. In thyroiditis, it will be like 10, 12, 14. In the sense, T3 will become 240. And the T4 will become 18, 20. Because it is T4 which is stored released. and gets released into the circuit. Mm -hmm. And the second thing which I said, thyrotoxicosis with hyperthyroidism, thyrotoxicosis without hyper. So here there is no hyperthyroidism, the gland is damaged. The hormone has come into circulation. If you do a scan, there will be no activity on the scan, only the salivary glands will be seen. And you may say that the medicine, nuclear medicine guy has made a mistake. No. That is a diagnostic test for you. And would you treat these patients with antithyroid drugs? Obviously not. Sometimes we use steroids, sometimes we use only anti-inflammatory, but the, the statement I used in the beginning, I tell my patient, apne ko time pass karna hai, aap achhe ho jaoge. These are self-limiting. Sometimes self-limiting may not be weeks, it may be even months. So that is where the hand-holding comes. And Either they become normal or hypo. So that is the time when you need to treat them. But again I repeat, by the end of one year most of them become normal. And we were taught that it is a once in a lifetime event. But now we are seeing some patients with recurrences. For the students again, I'll re re review the thyroiditis pathology. Basically, subacute viral thyroiditis is a condition where a virus attacks the gland, the thyroid gland, and damages the thyroid follicles such that the follicles which are storing the, are they called follicles, is that the correct term? The follicles that are storing the hormone suddenly flood the system with released hormone. Therefore, thyroiditis patients come with hyperthyroid features, what we call thyrotoxicosis. They are not hyperthyroid because the thyroid is not hyperfunctioning, but they become thyrotoxic and T3, T4 are elevated, TSH is suppressed, palpitations, tremors, etc. So, therefore, it becomes a differential for Graves' disease because patients are coming with high T3, T4, low TSH and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis. And these patients, as he said, the natural history is the virus damages the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland releases the hormone, there is hyper. After a while, the virus kind of quietens down, the big patient becomes euthyroid, and sometimes the regeneration of thyroid takes time, therefore the patient temporarily may go into hypothyroid. Occasionally, it will be a permanent hypothyroidism for some patients uh, uncommonly, but usually that hypothyroid is followed by another uh, then permanent euthyroid. So that is viral thyroidism. Thyroiditis. Why is it viral thyroiditis? Why is viral thyroiditis more common currently? Yeah. So uh, before I answer that mm. question, Sorry. one more thing. I said the scan is diagnostic. Two things which you can do in the blood, which will give you an answer. Um, besides the T3, T4, TSH, ask for an ESR. How many of you rely on an ESR in your practice? You still do? Okay. I don't do it, but. If you have subacute thyroiditis, besides malignancy and tuberculosis and collagen vascular, so there are very few conditions where the ESR is 100 plus. 100 plus. Yeah. So you could have an ESR of 30, 40, 50 for 1000 conditions or practically every condition, starting from anemia, 
to cough cold things. So the viral thyroiditis for obvious reasons today, because we are worried about the coronavirus, which has been shown known to affect the thyroid. So that's why I said we are seeing more often. But otherwise it's been around, I mean the other viruses are known to also. Be. So this is what we are discussing is subacute thyroiditis. There is another rare condition called acute thyroiditis, uh, which you can get a, you know, a staph infection, you see an abscess formation, those are all rare and they are, you know, the presentation is like you would see it, uh, an abscess somewhere else, you will get it here. So there is nothing great, uh, you, you can have a tuberculosis thyroiditis. So these are all the common thing for us is viral thyroiditis. So investigations wise, uh, WBC count will be high in viral thyroiditis. Neutrophils will be high even though it's a viral infection. It look like a bacterial infection from the CBC. ESR, CRP will be high. T3, T4 will be high. TSH will be low. Anti-TPO will be negative. Anti-TPO will be normal. Because this is negative. not an autoimmune condition. Correct. Uh, so we'll come to therapy now. What is your take on the treatment? So most patients, the attempt should be to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I mean, I'm happy just using aspirin. But if there is severe tenderness, classically they'll tell you that evening rise of temperature. And somehow we have been taught evening rise of temperature is tuberculosis. Yeah. So we start looking for tuberculosis. Then. Uh, we are not satisfied, we admit them, put them on parenteral antibiotics. Because unless you think of this diagnosis, you will not pick it up. So I would use steroids in patients who are very symptomatic. Forget the T3, T4 reports. If the patients are symptomatic, patients are very worried, you need to use, say, up to 1 milligram per kilogram body weight of prednisolone, either as one do daily dose or split daily dose. And we initially bring it down. So in medicine, there are very few things which work like magic. And subacute thyroiditis today afternoon, evening in your clinic, you prescribe prednisolone. Tomorrow morning, the patient will even forget that they had a bit disease. But yeah, steroids, we can't give them for long. So we try to taper them. But the tapering has to be in such a way that you don't cause a relapse. We come from say 50, 60 milligrams, 40 milligram, 20 milligram. Then between 15 and 10, again the patient can go into trouble. So this titration part has to be slow and it may take three weeks, it may take six months also. So there are times, you know, when uh, patients or their relatives come back saying, are you sure you know what you are doing? So you have to be very confident, like I said, in ESR, a scan gives you the diagnosis and then be patient, be confident that uh, avoid this temptation, acha ye char din ka augmentin le lo ya che din ka cephalosporin le lo. You don't need antibiotics, only steroids. And if you're giving steroids, then don't give uh, uh, anti-inflammatory also along with that. And another thing, you know, in the beginning you asked me which drug is most abused. Every steroid patient doesn't need a PPI. If the patient complains to you about acidity or discomfort or dyspepsia or something, please treat them. But really, if you take the steroid single dose after breakfast, they won't need it. Yeah, week to 10 days. Uh, remember in the beginning, he said there was a patient who brought another patient who said, aapne mera thyroid theek kar diya tha. So this is the situation, thyroiditis. So tell, her, tell them how it happens, ki aap, you become a magician. Yeah, so this is like one of the conditions where thyroid can be cured. You know, I can say Same. that, okay, we have cured the patient, but as I said, it's still time pass. I, I still have patients uh, 12, 15 years ago. When my classic, I had one lady uh, in the finance department of Air India. Even today on Doctor's Day, she uh, sends <laughs> me a greeting saying, I am the time pass patient. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, see, there are some of us who, you know, like I had one professor, I won't name him, but he melodramatic person because he was a doctor of most of the top stars in those days. You have to be melodramatic. Yeah. So, but otherwise, uh, I personally don't like ki aap aata mom pe baitha hua hai, kuch bhi ho sakta hai. Aray, wo to kal kuch bhi ho, kal kya bhi, ek ghante ke baad kuch bhi ho sakta hai. But 
let's not scare patients. Let's give them that confidence that you will become okay. And I am sure that pays in the long run. So in this situation, uh, we said that the natural history may take a sub subacute viral thyroid into hypothyroid, and then that patient will become euthyroid. Now, is it our job sometimes when a patient comes to you with the first high TSH report of 15, say, to think of past subacute viral thyroiditis causing this TSH and therefore go into the history and asking? Or is, is there a role of that? You know what I mean? That today is 15, if you have had COVID, you have had COVID, you have had COVID, you have had COVID, you have had radiation to the ear, should, should we do that? Uh, In every well, hypothyroid patient. I mean, asking one question, as long as you are only asking questions, <laughs> I am okay with it. But don't get into investigation. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, we go on to the... I think any, uh, now we we'll invite questions on thyroid disease. Yes. I'll repeat the questions for yeah. the other audience. She's asking in a natural history of subacute hypothyroid uh, subacute thyroiditis goes into high, goes into hypothyroid and. When do you start treatment for that hypothyroid, if at all? And if you start, when, uh, when can you expect the remission of that? Yeah. So you start the treatment uh, probably when you have two elevated TSH values. So if three or a four or a five is not a reason to start, but a three or a four and then an eight or a ten, knows, you know that this patient has not recovered. Uh, I said most of these patients recover in about six months' time. So we start with a regular dose of thyroxine, keep following up and you get an indication that this patient is recovering because the TSH starts going below normal. So sure. The question is a hypothyroid patient has been hypothyroid since a younger age and now becomes a senior citizen is there any change in monitoring or i think the only change is uh, your normal tsh i said um, i mean if i see a five or a six or a seven in a senior citizen i don't jump to increase the dose i say it's fine let's keep you as it is but talk to them if they have any symptoms that you can link it to hypothyroid but if the t4 is 9 10 8 uh, t3 maybe 70 80 90 I, d I won't increase the dose. I'll just wait. If I may extend his question, he is uh, he's also worried about possibly osteoporosis. If a patient is on thyroxine, and we know that excess thyroxine can worsen osteoporosis, should you do something about monitoring the osteoporosis? No, no. So, I, again, I mean, we want the TSH to be normal range. We're looking at the T4 to be normal range. And we understand that as you grow older, Osteoporosis is a possibility. So the indications for looking for osteoporosis are separate. Uh, standard in which standard not, things. not modified by this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I yeah yeah. So I mentioned that it's half an hour minimum. It could. The question is, is half an hour enough or one hour should be the gap between thyroxine and this? And any liquid, is any liquid allowed besides water? Yeah, no, so it's minimum half an hour. It can be more than that. And you're not allowed anything but water. So no honey water, no jeera water, no methi pani, no limbo pani, nothing. Yeah, doctor, there, yeah. She has weight, weight gain on. The question is, uh, the question is, the patient remains having weight gain, meaning has hypothyroid-like symptoms, but the TSH is 0 0.3. Should the dose be reduced or maintained? So if the T3, T4 are normal, and let's say this patient is young or middle age. Okay, 60 is still middle age. My definition of middle age is still <laughs> 
<laughs> it varies no, as you grow. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it keeps getting pushed every year. No, I would just keep this patient on observation. If, at the other hand, you find some cardiac issue, ECG changes, uh, blood pressure changes, I would, under observation, reduce the dose of thyroxine by about 12.5 micrograms and call them back within three months for follow-up. Dr. Wakharia. Slightly loudly. She is asking in a hyperthyroid patient who can sometimes become go into a storm, thyroid storm. Uh, due to a precipitating illness, what care should be taken? I suppose that is the question. Okay, so number one, once the patient is on antithyroid drug, uh, it's very rare to get it. Again, like I said, in medicine, it is never, always and never. So you need to be, uh, the symptoms for crisis are the same as for thyroidoxyl. There are no separate symptoms. It's just that they come up suddenly. Fever may be a part of the syndrome, but the blood pressure, the tachycardia, these may be very, very obvious. What we are worried about hyperthyroids, I, we didn't discuss that, but again, is they may be sometimes steroid, you know, requiring, in the sense their steroid levels are normal, but when they go into a uh, illness or a surgery or something, they may need some steroid uh, support. Because in endocrinology, when you have one autoimmune disorder, you can have other autoimmune disorders. So the adrenal may be affected. We don't keep checking every time, but sometimes we need to keep that in mind. The chances of crisis as such are very, very rare. But if they do occur, it's the same treatment. You need to step up the dose of uh, carbimazole, step up the dose of propranolol, and you may need steroid covers, like I said. Person next to Dr. Makaria. She's asking what happens if we change the brand. So this was a you know a study undertaken in the US with the American Thyroid Association that the thyroxine in every brand is the same. But the excipients, what they call, how the tablet is made, can vary from brand to brand. So if you change the brand, nothing may happen, but there may be allergic reaction, there may be certain odd reactions with this. So that is why the recommend. So when I say, suppose you want to change from brand A to B permanently, okay, you can do that. There is not no law against it. But if you want to go to A to B and then B to C and then you want to come back to A, that is not a good idea. As we know, you know, sometimes a patient will come to you saying, I am allergic to crocin, but I tolerate combi phlegm. So, that can happen. Dr. Shukla. He is asking about a TSH value of 25 in an asymptomatic female and he started thyroxine and he wants to know once it is normalized, should he continue the thyroxine? So a hypothyroid patient will have symptoms when the T3 really starts going down. So T4 is very low, TSH is very high, but T3 is still normal, the patient may be asymptomatic, number one. So your decision to treat 25 was perfectly correct. After starting treatment, after two, three months, when you said the report became normal, did the patient feel any better? You know, pehle achha tha, but now is she still better than what she was pehle? Because very often they don't have any complaints because they are used to that life. And then you treat them. Classically, you give them vitamin D or uh, iron supplements and they suddenly feel full of life, you know. So, what you did was correct and I would still continue with the same dosage. 
unless the TSH starts going below normal, 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 or whatever we say, and uh, then we try to reduce it. Otherwise, leave her alone. Dr. Pandit. Sir is asking uh, if a patient on 200 micrograms of eltroxin, thyroxin has a TSH of 0 0.001, should we stop the medicine or should we reduce? So good old days, you know, this 200 micrograms and 300 micrograms was for patients who had come out of thyroid carcinoma. That was the standard of treatment. Now the standard of care is to keep the TSH 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 or so. So when you get such a patient, you don't stop the treatment. You want to stop it for one week, I won't argue on it, but you need to bring the dose down. And remember that 1.7 microgram per kg body weight, if the patient is taking it properly, then you know this is the target. Uh, 1.7 is average, so you may need two also, but try to bring it down gradually. Dr. Seth. So, I will I'll just uh, basically asking about screening TSH. TSH is a part of routine screening procedure and TSH is a part of screening procedure specifically in diabetic patients. So, diabetes we say occurs in about 15% of population above the age of 20. And I said thyroid is about 10% of mm -hmm. the population. So, there is likely to be a lot of overlap just because of two common diseases occurring together. But there is some evidence to sh show that diabetics do have a higher incidence of thyroid. And today, doing a TSH is not a big deal. So if you were to ask me, would I do it? I don't do it in every patient, but I do it at the slightest doubt. And even without my doing, there are so many packages that are available where a TSH is a part of the package. So I don't break my head on that. But yes, if I have to scientifically answer it, there is some evidence to show. And especially the type 1, the autoimmune, that is very clear. I mean, type 1 diabetes, uh, Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, Graves disease, they can occur together. But Dr. Bhamre is there. Quite a few questions, I'll, uh, I'll try to take all of them. Uh, he's asking whether first time detection of high blood pressure with detection of hypothyroidism, as we know hypothyroidism can cause high blood pressure, should we simultaneously start treating blood pressure? So as I mentioned that uh, a lot of these comorbidities can go with hypothyroidism. So if the uh, lipids are say 20-25% more than normal, blood pressure is 140, uh, 90, 150, 100 and you are not in a hurry, I would first treat the thyroid get the patient normal and then take a decision. So, uh, yeah, doctor. I mean, that was about some hyper. Hyper only, okay. I think he mentioned that. Uh, but yeah, uh, she was asking about the indications of giving antithyroid therapy in subclinical hyperthyroidism premenopausal. Yeah, so that's right. I repeat, postmenopausal will treat. Premenopausal and in men, we wait for two, three visits. Unless there is something to say that no, this is not right. Even if that T3, T4, a normal patient is losing weight, gets arrhythmias, tremors. See, treat medical treatment will not harm <coughs> and it is worth giving a therapeutic trial. Call the patient back after three months and take a decision whether you have done right or wrong. Dr. Hirin? Did 
this patient, meaning he said that will TSH of 25 doing anti TPO help in continuation of therapy? So I think about 10 we decided. Yeah, we said that about 10 we won't do anti TPO. About 10 you must treat lifelong unless it was a subacute viral thyroid that is causing a transient hypothyroidism. I think we should not stop. Yeah, Dr. Sarekmin, I'll come to you. Before you ask, please don't ask questions which have been asked. Please be awake. About 10 TSH, do not argue about asymptomatic. Even if you are a homeopath, you must treat. Must treat. There is no question of not treating. So, anytime you have a doubt, <coughs> today, you know, doing a T3, T4 TSH in Mumbai city, you feel this lab is not correct, you do it there. But don't uh, worry about the result because patients may be asymptomatic. I mean, I have seen TSHs of 200, uh, T4 of 2 and 3, and TSH, uh, T3 of 50, 60, 70. And patient is fine. No, I don't have anything to say. Sir, you say? He is asking about this drug induced thyroid disease, especially lithium and uh, amiodarone. Yeah, perfectly uh, right asking that question. But probably in your practice, if you see someone on lithium or amiodarone uh, induced thyroid problem, please refer to a physician. Don't get into it. But what is more important for them is how yeah. frequently should they monitor TSH in such patients? Uh, once in six months or so. In normal patients without thyroid without problem on lithium and uh, or amiodarone, yeah, you need to check on them every six months. Dr. Jumani? Yeah, so it is… He is asking if TSH is trimester specific. Absolutely, he is right. Uh, TSH is trimester specific. Don't break your head on it. If you keep it at 2.5, you are taking care of all trimesters. Dr. Sunita? Yeah, so after delivery, if this patient was hypothyroid pre-pregnancy, we go back to the same dosage. If this patient was newly diagnosed, there are two possibilities. One is, you know, the TSHs were 3, 4, 5, 6. They generally recover. They don't need any treatment. Dr. Sunita? She is asking what TPO cutoff above which we should consider it high. So there are two ways of reporting TPO. One is positive negative and one is when they actually give you a titer or a number. A positive is a positive. Only thing is, yeah, if it is instead of uh, 9 or 15 or 20, you get a report of 1300, which is probably the upper limit of what the labs give you. Then you know that, yeah, the chances of progression to hypothyroidism are much more. The chances of permanent hypothyroidism are much more. But it doesn't decide the dose of your thyroxine. Mm -hmm. Dr. Devesh, last question. So it's I like did not get the question, no, so no, you so might repeat that. So his question is, the active form of the hormone is T3 or free T3. So why we don't talk about T3? We are talking of only TSH and T4. So it's like this. You know, the, the way I talk to my patients, not to doctors, but I explain to my patients that the TSH actually gives you the overall financial health or thyroid health. And the T4 is like the money in your bank, your credit, you can say. And T3 is the money in your purse. So when you start going through bad times, your credit and your deposits may go down, but you still have money in your purse to live. 
still a time comes when you don't have enough money for that also. So if you start looking at the money in your purse, then probably it will be too late to know that you have gone into trouble. So the body, the TSH goes up first, the T4 goes down and finally the T3 goes down. So we can't wait for T3 to go down. No, T3 is last because that is the most, so the body conserves T3. So in normal person I said 80% is T4 and 20% is T3 from the thyroid. But once the thyroid starts failing, then these numbers change. It may become even 50-50. Last question, Dr. Kiran Desai, last question. He is asking if calcium supplementation is mandatory in all thyroid patients. Let's take this question in the... We will take this question after the break. We are having a short break uh, uh, for tea, a coffee, and uh, please come back as soon as possible. <laughs>